Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 5th, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules, so thank you so much. All right, what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, and this is for your benefit, wait until we get the actual charts, so I make sure I see what stocks you're asking about. And then ask about one stock at, the, at a time. You can ask about as many as you want, and I will stay here until um, as long as possible. Usually at about an hour and a half, we have to uh, shut things down just to keep the recording stable. So what's our focus going to be this week? Well, your brain on trading, both before and during, and that's going to make a lot of sense in a few, a lot of sense in a few minutes. Before we do that, let's take a quick look at the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. The easy way to sum that up is all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I've been working on a trading psychology course on and off for years. I started a few years back and it became such a massive project that I shelved it. And then I did the trading full circle course and a lot of that research came from the psychology research that initially did uh, that went into the psychology part of that course and getting back to the main psychology course in working on it I started out with an introduction like okay well how can I help you I'm not a psychiatrist I'm not a psychologist so how can I help you well as someone who trades and have been through ups and downs over the last 20 something years. I know I know how you feel. I feel your pain, so to speak. And I still feel those pains and still feel those urges and feelings of not wanting to do the right thing and being uh what's a good word for it? Tempted, I guess, to do the wrong thing, to overtrade, to maybe hang on a little too long to maybe lock in a profit before it evaporates. And what's interesting is through my research and all this, I'm beginning to find out more and more that it's natural. So I've been fighting these behaviors in order to do the right thing. But the more I get into this, the more I realize that these things are natural. Anyway, in the along the how can I help you slides, I came across this from Douglas. You always get something good from Mark. God rest his soul. The more we understand about the interacting forces behind our own behavior and the interacting forces outside of us, the easier it is to fulfill our needs and achieve our goals. So if you think about that, the more you understand about how markets are irrational and why people buy and sell stocks, all the basic stuff that I covered in the, in the free videos on in Trading Full Circle that the market's made up a bunch of emotional participants and so are you. That makes your life a little easier there. And the more that we understand ourselves from a physiological standpoint and from a psychological standpoint, especially as it relates to trading, the better off we are. So get along back to the long lines of how can I help you? It's kind of like, well, we all share the same physiology and we all share pretty much the same psychology when it comes to trading now your deep-seated motives for why you tend to make certain mistakes that might require a little noodling to figure out and you may never figure that out but as long as you know to do the right thing and when you feel that animosity or whatever the word is when you're when you're going to do the wrong thing and you correct it you'll be fine and then what's awesome for me in doing all this research has been that I've had all these epiphanies along the way. It's like, okay, well, now I know why it's so hard for me to do this. I've been at this 20-something years. Why is it so damn hard for me to just follow the plan? Why is it so damn hard for me not to want to fire off this trade when I'm looking at my screens as opposed to working on a project and keeping myself busy like I preach? Well, I keep having these epiphanies the deeper and deeper I get into it. And... Epiphany is one of my favorite words. It's a sudden intuitive perception or insight into the reality or essential meaning of something. And here's the clincher. It's usually initiated by some simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence 
or experience. Just little tiny things that I've been picking up and going through all this research. So research is like, okay, well, that's why I struggle in this. And that's why I do the hard thing, even though it's a hard thing. But now it's a lot easier to embrace these things. So one of the epiphanies that I had this week, in fact, was while reading Brett Steenbarger's book, The Psychology of Trading, I came across this. People lose money in the markets because the person who places the trade very often is not the same person who manages and closes the trade. Quite literally, another self has taken over another mind. Well, this got me thinking. This is why it's so darn hard to follow the plan. Planning the trade and trading the plan are two completely different things. And we're going to explore that in just a few minutes. But the bottom line is there are two U's that are working. One that plans a trade and one that actually executes the trade. Now, when you're going into a trade, you're pretty excited about the potential. But once you get into the trade, things change quickly. Going into the trade, you have optimism. Once you get into the trade, you're going to be faced with hope. Now, there's some excitement. You find a cool-looking setup, a nice little TKL like I've shown here. You think, wow, this could be great. Then you get into the trade, and what happens? The market triggers and goes sideways. This is an actual trade for what it's worth. And obviously, you're going to be enthusiastic. There's going to be enthusiasm involved. But getting into the trade... There's going to be fear. Now, before the trade, there's going to be promise. Okay? I know I'm kind of using the same word to mean the same thing. Different words mean the same thing. But there is some sort of promise of the future. When you find that good-looking setup, and you've seen this setup, provided you've done your homework and, and put a few reps in, but you've seen this setup 100 times or 1,000 times, and you've seen markets double from this setup, then you know there's going to be some promise. Well, the reality sets in once you get into the trade. Maybe it's not going to double. Maybe it's going to stop out at a loss. And sometimes, even on a trade like this one, which turned into a double, it goes sideways for a while, making you think that, it's not going to materialize. Now, I've given this speech quite a bit, and this is kind of the reading Steenbarger kind of helps me wrap my head around it. So even before I knew what was happening, before I had this epiphany this week, I gave plenty of speeches. If you go back and look at the weekly charts where I talk about the known, the left side of the chart versus the unknown. The right side of the chart, right? And by the way, what's the old joke? Find a broker that lets you trade off the left side of your chart, and you'll do quite well. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist. So you are stepping into the unknown as soon as you make that trade. And again, if you go in and watch the older weekend charts, you'll see that that's a reoccurring theme. But it, it's not until up until now that I realize how important those two sides of the trade are. Now, there's a high degree of logic before the trade. You could say, well, this is a pretty serious move higher. You can't see it going back in time, but this is an accelerated move. It's also a very persistent one. Notice I drew this line through most of the bars. Mathematically, that's known as linear regression. You could also measure this, and I think one of my 
words coming up as statistics. But you can also measure this from a statistical standpoint. But as soon as that trade triggers, emotions begin to kick in. There it is. So, again, now I believe in being a discretionary trader, and I'm going to talk about left brain, right brain in a few minutes. But this is somewhat logical and statistical, okay? If I had to reduce it all down, it's like, well, this is linear regression. The fact that the stock moved higher in this persistent manage, man, uh, the stock moved higher in this persistent manner. And you could also measure this trend, and then you could also measure this retracement of this trend knockout bar, or as I call them, TKOs, okay? So you have this TKO bar here, which is a percentage of the prior move higher. Now, I don't actually measure the percentage. I just kind of eyeball it, okay, the right brain versus left brain thing. But if you wanted to, you could. And I think in my brain, I actually am – measuring it i'm just not reducing it down to a statistical percentage or whatever the case may be so you're statistical on the left side you're irrational on the right side and it's not necessarily just you that's irrational the point i'm making here is that the market is statistical and measurable over here but the actions here or and can often be irrational now, again, there's certainty on the left side of the chart before the trade because everything is known. And that goes back to those prior presentations that I've done where you go from the known stepping into the unknown. Well, the left side before the trade, everything is absolutely certain. You know exactly what the stock did. You know exactly how it performed. Well, as soon as you step off to the right, you actually make the trade, then you step into uncertainty, obviously. So everything is static on the left and everything is fluid on the right. Now, I think it was Montier that said, from a psychological standpoint, stress comes in when information is changing or uncertain. Well, before you make that trade, everything is static. There's no information that's changing or uncertain. So you're using one part of your brain before the trade, and then as soon as that trade kicks in, another part of your brain, and often a more primal part of your brain, as we'll see in a few minutes, begins to kick in. Now, unless you're going to find somebody to manage your trades – OK, you're going to have to embrace and understand the two U's. I knew a trader who was really into doing the research. And he really enjoyed the process and he'd spend a lot of time finding setups. And he'd find the best setups that he could. But he wasn't really good at actually managing the trade. Well, that almost sounds familiar, right? We all seem to have that problem. That's the hard part. Initially, when I heard the story, I'm thinking, well, she's got the easy job. No, 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 just the opposite. So his wife had no interest in doing the research, but the way she operated was she was methodical in the following of the plan to make sure that the profits were taken when, when it was time to take the profits, that the trade stayed on when it had to stay on and the trade came off when it was time to come off. So she actually ran the trades. And initially I thought, well, that's just kind of following the plan. That can't be that hard. And then the more I thought about it, Dave, hey, what are you saying? It's incredibly hard to follow the plan. I was thinking as we're going live here today, I would love it if some huge hedge fund hired me and said, Dave, give us the trades, give us the plan. And we'll take care of it. In fact, if we don't take care of it, we'll we'll let you talk to the traders and give them a, a WTF. Why aren't you following the plan? I met a trader once who had a system, but it didn't quite fit his psyche. It's something that he simply couldn't do. But he believed in it. He knew it worked. But he personally could not trade it. 
So he actually hired a trader to trade it. And he said, look, if you don't follow the system, I'm going to follow you. Well, that person had a whole different set of emotions, okay? His emotions were such that I'm going to follow this plan exactly because I don't want to get fired. I don't care about whether it's making money, losing money, whether or not, whatever, you know, all these monetary things. I'm more worried about my job, so I'm going to follow along. Well, the problem is unless you hire someone or there is a second you, a better half of you, to actually manage the trades, then you're gonna to have to embrace and accept the two U's. Now, one thing that Steenbarger was talking about is that the different parts of the brains that, that can sort of influence our behavior. I'm not gonna get into the psychology of all that, but his example was someone who'd had some very bad behaviors or addictive type of behaviors, and that was coming from one part of the brain. And if it's taken to an extreme, people who have these could actually have multiple personalities by letting these parts of their brains take over. Now, we're going to assume that we're all relatively sane. We're all crazy for being in this business. We all agree on that. But we're all going to assume that we're relatively sane, but we still have different parts of our brain that make it hard for us to do the right thing. Now, without getting into neuroscience too deeply, I thought probably the easiest way to explain it would be old brain, new brain, left brain, right brain. You could tell that. I'm a big fan of Dr. Seuss. Now, by the way, if you're interested in the parts of the brain and a lot of the research that I'm doing here that will go into the trading psychology course is from, I think his name is Paul McLean. It's triune brain. So if you Google that, you'll get a lot into the triune brain, which talks about our three actual brains. But to keep things simple, let's talk about the old brain and new brain today. The old brain is the more primal type of, of brain. And it's only worried about four things. Flight, the four Fs. Fight, food, and does anyone know what the fourth one is? Anyone? No, 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 I have to keep this. <laughs> no, I have to keep this PG-13. I just, uh, iTunes just accepted me to get back on uh, on their uh, platform. No, 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 no. Fornicate. <laughs> and that's all our brains, or the old brain at least, is concerned with. So... As I talked about in Trading Full Circle, part of our limbic system, we have the amygdala. And that's responsible for the perception of emotions such as anger, fear, and sadness. And the reason I like this definition is because it has the word perception in it. So you could actually change your perception. Now, that's old brain, new brain, left brain, right brain, we all know. We have one side of our brain that's creative and one side of our brain that's logical. So if you think about it, before the trade is going to be more new brain oriented, okay? The part of the brain that makes us uh, makes us us, and I believe it's called the neocortex. Neo meaning new, cortex I think meaning ribbed. I'm not sure exactly. I'll show you how little I know, but I'm I'm working on it. But that's the part that makes us us. That's the left brain and the right brain. And of that, the left brain is the more logical brain. Now, I believe that. Stock picking and trading is more of an art than a science in that I've actually read this more than once. The life of the trader is more of like a life of the artist, and I think we're more artists than we are more of this uh, strict logic. But if you're newer to trading, then before the trade is much more left brain. And like Douglas, um, not Douglas, Curtis Faith said in Trading from the God, 
it's like if you have this intuition type of feeling from the right brain, you send it over to the left brain to get a little reasoning from it and to kind of confirm what you're feeling in that right side of your brain. And we'll get into that in a few minutes, a little bit deeper. But as a general statement, it is a little bit more left brain, like I said earlier, because it is quantifiable. You could say, well, there was this linear regression of this persistency. There was this, this knockout type of move. And if you did measure it, then it, yes, it would be deep enough to have likely knocked some people out. So I think there's an art there. There's a right brain there, there, but there's also a left brain. And I think your right brain, after you've been at this a while, and that's why I'm able to go through 2,000 charts or more every night, is because my, my intuition, my right brain is seeing the pattern, and then my left brain is like, okay, yes, it it's trades cleanly. It's not too choppy. It, it basically confirms all the other things that the other side of my head, the intuition, saw right away. Read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, which would be good reading on that. Now, once you get into the trade, the old brain tends to kick in. As I've said, ad nauseum, you can't make any decision without invoking the old brain, without using that limbic system, the amygdala, without emotions. If the people who have the unfortunate either accident or illness, as I've said, ad nauseum, can no longer make any decisions because there's no consequence involved with the decision. But the secret is to bypass that that old brain once you're in the trade. And I'll show you how to do that in just one second. And then your right brain tends to be a little bit more emotional than your left brain. So your right brain might be messing with you, so to speak, along with your old brain once you're in the trade. So as I said a second ago, what you want to be able to do is if you're feeling something, you want to send it over to the other side of your brain, to the left brain, to check it out, okay? So when you see that great looking setup, hold on, send it over to the left side of the brain to check it out. If you're stressed out over position, then make sure you're thinking about it logically, like why am I not following the plan? There's a great graphic on the internet once you start Googling left brain, right brain, and I contact, I tried to contact the artist, I emailed him, and I haven't heard back. I want to use it. It's been used at least a thousand times that I can find in presentations. And what's cool about it is that on one side, you've got these people like out in the park, flying to kites and painting and doing all these wonderful things. And then on the other side, you've got a bunch of people in cubicles hunched over computers producing a bunch of ones and zeros. But in the middle, there are several bridges going back and forth. And that, that kind of sums up the, the whole brain approach. And there's a few pages in. Uh, trading from the gut, which I'd recommend you read. It's a short, it's a little book. It's a short read, but that's Curtis Faith. And I'm, I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed that one. He talks a lot about, the, and he, he does touch upon the triune brain, Paul McLean type of uh, analysis or analogy, I should say, and sending things over to the other side of your brain to check it out. Now, once you find yourself in that emotionally charged part, again, every decision can have emotions, but when you go to break the rules and you find that emotional part of your brain kicking over, taking over, all you might have to do is breathe, okay? And I'll give you an exercise, and this exercise has, has worked tremendously well for me since I learned about it. So the next time you're getting ready to have a emotional reaction with your spouse or significant other, that initial snap thing, you know, that comes back, don't count to three. And 
You're welcome. And scientists have proven that all it takes is a few seconds to get past that emotional part of your brain to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. Now, I like to see the amygdala as a little panic monster, which I've got from Wait But Why. If you watch the TED video from this guy, it's it's pretty hysterical. I'd, I'd recommend you watch it. I don't know. I forget his name, but Wait But Why, you can find it there. So you have to tiptoe past the panic monster. And where I got that from was Dr. Robert Mard wrote a book called The Kaizen Way. He also wrote a book called Mastering Fear. I'd recommend you read both of those. And he talked about how you tiptoe past your fears by taking very tiny, small steps. And that's the Kaizen way. So this is how you tiptoe past the panic monster once you're in the trade. When you feel those emotions coming on, stop, count to three, take a deep breath, get a cup of coffee or whatever. And think about what you're going to do. And, and that might be all it takes. Now, there's not enough time to get into it today, but obviously there's some physical things you could do, like stop watching a damn screen so much. And that's going to save that's going to save your life longer term, both literally uh, or I guess literally physically, I should say. Because you're going to be you're only wired to make so many decisions. And the more you watch that screen, the more unnecessary decisions you're going to make and the more you're going to be sucked into the siren call of day trading. Now, if you're a day trader. And that's what you do, and that's what you're good at, then do it. But I would encourage you to realize that we're only wired for so many decisions, and this goes for all of us. Now, you might be wired for a few more decisions than someone else, but eventually it's going to wear you down. But I think there are a few exceptions to that rule, but I've known quite a few people who've gone crazy trying to day trade because it's too many decisions. So make fewer decisions, but make better decision. So the point is you want to make sure you're using your whole brain and you also want to make sure as Steen Barger alluded to, you don't want to be held hostage by that one part of your brain, that one part of your brain that is going to F up your discipline. And that could be in life too, the discipline of not exercising or the discipline of breaking your diet or whatever that discipline you need is. But when you do have some sort of behavior that goes against your plan, recognize that that might be your brain kind of effing with you, okay? And then in that particular case, go ahead and take a breath and then make sure you're analyzing the situation properly and avoid busting that plan. Now, again, we could probably talk about this for for days, but there's a few things you can do. Obviously, once you're in the trade, walk away from your screens if you have to. If there's nothing to do, that trade I just showed recently triggered and just kind of died, but it didn't stop out. It didn't do anything wrong. Well, there was nothing to do for weeks in that trade. But I guarantee you, if you watch that trade, if you watch every little tick, then you would be inclined to exit it early. And then, of course, that turned into one of the bigger winners. Now, obviously, you could get better before you get into the trade. And that's going to make you better in the trade. So I know it's cliche, but you need to pick the best and leave the rest. And as I've been kind of beating a dead horse on lately, garbage in, garbage out. And that's why it took 14 hours when I did the stock selection course to cover proper stock selection. And a simple exercise you could do here, and is the way I learned how to pick stocks, was deliberate practice. And there's, um, if you poke around my website, deliberate practice, I've got a few articles on that. But deliberate practice in a nutshell is working harder to get better. It's not just practice. You want to practice to become better and the way i do that is one the practice in and of itself looking at a lot of charts every day two every time i see a stock that takes off i copy it over to a minimalist and i look at it carefully 
and I say, okay, could I have caught this move and should I have caught that move? If the move doesn't fit my system and I'm comfortable with my system, then sometimes markets just take off without you. As I've said before, you can't kiss all the women. And that's psychologically, that's a tough thing too, is letting go of that, the fact that you will miss some moves. Especially those are obviously that are obviously outside of your methodology. So, you know, along the garbage in, garbage out, Papa John would probably make a good trader. Better ingredients, better pizza. And this is why I often talk about the holistic part of trading. Money management will cure a multitude of sins, as I often say. If you follow your money management plan, then it's going to take you out of your stinkers and it's going to keep you in your winners. But if you back it up one step to the before, if you're picking the best stocks to begin with, then you're going to have more winners. Then from a psychological standpoint, you're going to start feeling better about your trade. You're going to get more confidence. And then you're going to guess what? Pick more and more winners. And you'll recognize what a loser looks like and what a winner looks like. And you'll be more apt to, here comes the money management, kick that loser out of your portfolio. And then coming back to the methodology, you can see how it keeps going full circle here. You're going to start picking better and better stocks. And more importantly, or as importantly, not trade mediocre setups and trade in less than ideal conditions because you like what the winner feels like you like what the winner looks like you know what the loser looks like and you want more winners and less losers so going into the trade obviously you want to get better at that now you need to be cognizant of your feelings i noticed that steen barger said something about keeping an emotional journal and like hey that makes a lot of sense so i was kind of looking for a slide or a graphic on that, and I'm like, wait a minute, didn't I do something on this? And it's like I go back into my PC, dug around for a while, and I found that I've often talked about being cognizant of your emotional. So he talked about keeping an emotional journal, and this is something that I've talked about many years ago in the weekend chart. So not only do you have to keep a journal of your trades, and I just throw them in a spreadsheet, but also keep – a journal of your emotions and that could be a positive thing one thing that I've done in more recent times not to go off too much on a tangent imagine that but Tim Ferriss talks about a jar of awesome where you do something if you did something awesome during the day write down a piece of paper put it in a jar so you have a record of that but lately my jar of awesome has been I've got a little tiny notebook and I've been writing down my accomplishments every day and that's really helped me uh, in trading and life and everything. So I would encourage you to do that. But it also, embrace your emotions. And we all have, life is hard. I forget who, um, is that uh, Sagan? No, somebody said, anyway, I'm trying to think of who, who first said life. is. It's a book that starts off, life is hard. It's like, yeah, okay, I got you. But life is hard. And if you embrace all those emotions that comes with life, it gets a lot easier in your trading and make sure that's not affecting your trading. So the more cognizant you are of what's going on during that during of the trade, the better off you're going to be. So going back to the why we do the wrong things, once we're in a trade, it's something that I've often talked about. It's like, well, we know we're doing the wrong thing, but we do it anyway. Well, now, now I know why we do it anyway, because we're becoming hostage to that part of our brain. And this was an email that actually turned into a, a, an article that was in Traders Magazine. It was published in... Germany and uh, Britain and a few other countries, maybe Greece, Spain, Italy. I know, but 
she emailed me and said, you know, that pastor and Paul, I, I, I know not to do, but I do it anyway. Well, that's the good news. And that's what I got into deeply into in the, in the trading full circle psychology section is that, you know, what you're doing wrong. Well, there's a pretty damn good chance, you know, what you're doing wrong. And if you don't, I bet I could figure it out pretty quickly. And I'd be willing to do that as a courtesy for you. If you've been at this for a while and you're struggling, give me a call and we'll figure out what you're doing wrong. Now, sometimes it might be something very mechanical, but more often than not, or quite often, I should say, you know what you're doing wrong and you're doing anyway. Getting back to this email, so I looked up Romans 719 and it says, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And that's what's hard is you, you feel inclined and tempted to do the wrong thing and often do the wrong thing as opposed to just following the plan. I guess my whole epiphany in this whole thing is that now I know why it's hard to follow the plan. All right, let's shift gears here and get into a couple of money management examples from last week and I think the week before. Before we do that, any thoughts or questions on on why it's so hard to follow a plan? Any any light bulbs going off out there? Am I you know I'm all excited about this, but I want to make sure I'm reaching you guys and girls. And you know maybe it's not meaningful to you, but to me it's it's, a, it's another one of my little epiphanies that I had. And I tend to be an emotional an easily excited being, you know, type A personality. And I've taken personality tests as part of this uh, trading psychology journey. And that reveals a lot. And that, that really helps you wrap your head around some of these behaviors. All right, no questions on that? All right, let's take a look at a couple of uh, money management examples. These are better than a poke in the eye type of trades. Now, the secret to trading is losing as much losing as much losing as as little as possible and making as much as possible and one way to do that which is my absolute most favorite thing is to establish what i call free positions and by free you get in you take a partial profit and your stop is bumped to break even and if it turns into the mother of all trends, you're still in. If it doesn't, you get the better, the po better than a poke in the eye trade. Now, the better than a poke in the eye trade, as you'll see in these next two slides, is not going to make you rich, but it will keep you in the game. And it will help to keep the lights on. So here's a case where we had a pullback in an IPO. And then it triggers an entry. And then the next day, it shot up and hit the initial profit target. So what do you do? Well, you take partial profits, and then you trail your stop higher. Well, in this particular case, it stops out for a scratch. So if you take a look at the actual trade, this is based on a 100K account. Everything to keep the math easy in the portfolio is based on a 100K account. So we're looking for a 1% on the first loaf, which is right here. And we're looking for some multiple of that right here. Well, we scratched out. Well, it's better than a poke in the eye. Now, I don't know if we ought to, if you want to play the game, but if you annualize that trade there, 1% in two days is, is like ridiculous amount or day and a half, how long you with it, would probably be thousands of percent a year. If you could do that on every trade every day. But we know that it doesn't happen every day. But when it does, having an entry, an initial profit target, a stop, and a means by which you're going to trail your stop, make your life a lot easier if, and it's a big if, and I realize that, if you follow the plan. So, again, you know, all this is, from, from this point here, on this day here, all this 
pretty damn easy. It's pretty damn easy to make a plan once once you have the general mechanics down. And as you can see from these examples, they're not rocket science. They're just pullbacks, okay? Even a TKO, which is a specialized pullback, it's just a pullback. Now, here's another example. Again, there's that pullback, my favorite pattern. You had a buy point, you had a stop point, you had an initial profit target, okay? And then once again, it turned into a better than poke in the eye trade. Now, in an ideal world, you're at break even, you've got the free position on, and this goes to the moon. Was it to the moon, Alice? I forget who. <laughs> Show my age. Uh, and that's a great thing. We have one of those open now. I sure would like to have 10 of them open. And I believe me, I've been working hard to find some. And if you look at the actual trade, this actually stopped out today. Now, in this particular case, it stopped out at a gain, so it's much better than the poke in the eye. That's a one point, what's that? Let's just do it round numbers, 1.4% move over, well, I don't know, what's that, a month? Okay. That's still a pretty decent return if you annualize it. Now, I don't want to play the annualized game because it doesn't mean we're going to do this every day. But as you can see, it's better than the poke in the eye, and it keeps you in the game. It puts a little bit of money in your account. And it also frees up a slot in your portfolio so you can go out and find the next big winner. So if there is a secret to trading, I know every week I say, this is a secret to trading. This is a secret to, to trading. Well, the number one secret is there is no secret, okay? But if there was a secret, other than following your plan and other than garbage in, garbage out, it would be to position yourself for... A small profit, if that's all you get, and a big profit should it materialize. All right, any questions on money management? I know everybody here is, is up to speed, but in case somebody we have anybody new in the group. Craig says I'll take one of those a day. Yeah, me too. Yeah, if I could get one of those a day, you'd never see my fat ass again. <laughs> All right. I got an email last week, and I wanted to work it into the week of charts, but I just didn't have time. But I think it's more relevant to what we're doing today. So let's take a look at this. And I have a few comments on this. I think this is probably fodder for a complete column or maybe even a whole presentation. Hi, Dave. I've been trading Forex for a couple of years now with very mixed results. A while back, I came across your website and registered and went through the free material you were offering, articles, webinars, and anything I could find I read and watched. I never really sat down and developed the trading methodology that I followed like a true gospel. Frustrated with the results I was getting, I went back to the drawing board, looked at the trading material I'd accumulated over the years. I got rid of – that should be a T there – I got rid of almost everything in my trading library except your material. Beginning of this year, I really immersed myself in your teachings. I put together a simple plan that would have me trade trends. I would not even try to play a trend reversal trade no matter how great the setup looked. Well, this speaks volumes, and he's saying a lot here. Number one. Put together a plan and follow it like a gospel. Amen. Follow the trends. The only way to make money in the market is to catch a trend. And as you can see, he says that he doesn't play reversals or stop playing reversals no matter how great they looked. Well, this infers to me that a reversal trade is an ego-driven trade. I want to catch the top of this market. I want to catch the bottom of this market. I want to play that reversal. There's a lot more ego in that than being a trend-following moron, taking a quote-unquote dumb approach and just following along. 
Now, if you're a reversal trader and that's all you do and you committed your life to it, that's fine, okay? But I think you'd be much better off keeping things simple and just become a trend follower and follow the trend all the time since that's the only way to ever make money in the market is to capture a trend. He went on to say, I was surprised with the results. Sticking to the plan turned my trading from shooting from the hip and getting mediocre results to consistently making small profits. Best thing is my trading became more stress-free. Well, if you get back into the deeper into the brain or get back to some of this brain speak we're talking about, shooting from the hip and getting emotional and all these other things is going to release that dopamine and make you feel good. Unfortunately, the round trip is pretty bad. And that's why, one of the reasons why, it's a little bit more deeper into the chemistry and biology. But, but that's one reason why when you drink some alcohol, it has a certain effect on you. But if you drink more and more alcohol, it has less and less an effect. What was the, um, I actually have, this is a slide in the, in the course when we get on dopamine. But uh, who's the band? It used to take one, now it takes four. You don't get me high anymore. And that's one of those downward spirals we can get into when trading becomes exciting. And the other thing is the, the, the emotional impact of a winner is much smaller than the emotional impact of a loser. So I don't want to go into a downward spiral and all this stuff, but you, you get a much bigger charge or a much bigger emotional response out of a loser and that's one of those lopsided things that can really put you into that spiral. And then, as you can see, he says here, his trade became more stress-free. Well, to me, it seems like, and I don't want to speak for him, it seems like he's backed away from that screen a little bit. And he's not taking those trades that are outside of methodology or ego-driven trades. And he's just following the plan. Well... I helped one client by telling him, I said, you know, once you do this long enough, you're going to realize that if you're doing it properly, it's really pretty damn boring. And that was kind of like his little switch that got flipped, like, wow, you're right. And then he finds excitement elsewhere in his life. So I made a decision that I would be mentored by you as if it was your teachings that turned around my trading. Charles Methonsi, South Africa. So anyway, I just thought that he really, through Charles's journey, you could see where he's, he's going through this journey. It sounds like he's going through the Holy Grail hunt. And again, this is fodder for a lot of research and, and uh, or presentations, I should say. But he's, it sounds like he's going through the Holy Grail hunt he was tempted a lot to violate his plan. He also was tempted to make, again, not to beat the dead horse, a lot of ego-driven trades. And then his epiphany was, hey, keep it simple, follow the trend, follow the plan. Write that down. That makes a lot of sense. Keep it simple, follow the trend, follow the plan. I know, easier said than done, but the bottom line is that's all you have to do. All right. Let's hop into the charts. Any questions on anything so far? I'll get the charts fired up. You guys want to start, and girls, want to start asking about individual stock questions, feel free to do so now. I'll take a quick look at the markets, and then we'll pop into uh, your individual stock picks. In fact, let's take a look at the major mix. It's one thing I like to do. When the market is at or near new highs, I like to look at the main sectors. Now, before we do that, let's take a look at the P's and everything else. Donald, that's on the lander list today, and, I'm, and I, I love that stock. That's a that's so high five. Good job. I can't obviously out of courtesy to the clients. I can't uh, we can't discuss it, but yeah, good job on that one. Donald's talking about a little energy stock, a lower price energy stock. So I'll give you a couple of hints. If you want to go find that. <laughs> Me and 
Mrs. Blank. Mrs. Blank, Mrs. Blank, Mrs. Blank. We got a thing going on. That's a hint. That's the stock name. So Google that. You might figure it out. All right, S&P 500. Bam. Winning. It's not said. Ah, Ken figured it out. Good job, Ken. <laughs> SP 500, not setting the world on fire today, but hey, you know, it's up a little over a third percent, better than poking the eye. One thing that I wrote about recently, at least an article that I refreshed or repurposed that's on my website on the why I teach trading. I teach trading because it helps me learn, okay? It helps me become a better trader. And one of, one of my things that I was not aware of was how important shorter term persistency can be. And I think, I know everything I say is fodder for research, but I really think this is fodder for research. And the way I learned this was back on my first trip to Italy when I was in front of, the, I was in front of this huge screen, as you'll see, it's on my website somewhere. And I would look up and to see the a price bar literally be about four feet high, it's like, wow, it just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks. And one of the things I learned from that was that the shorter term persistency, meaning that a market tends to go up day after day after day after day, can be quite powerful, even on a shorter term basis. Now, if you look at the persistent pullback, my rule there, the general rule at least, is that you need 20 days or one month of trading. But I noticed that even shorter term, persistency could be quite powerful. So if you guys want to go do some research, maybe come up with a system, and I wouldn't trade it mechanically, but come up with a system that you enter the market after three days of persistency to the upside or four days of persistency to the upside. Because you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we now have nine, I'm sorry, eight days of persistent upside movement. So that's a little, little tip that I want to throw out to you, something to check out on your own. Report back to me if you like. But you can see, bam, winning at brand new high. So far, so good. S&P 500. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Same thing going on there. Up about a third of percent also today. And notice, again, we've got a nice little persistent move in the works. So far, so good. Now, one thing that's kind of cool is buying often begets more buying. When a market is at new highs and the reason is people have to put up a shut up and a lot of times people get out of a market thinking that it's too high and then they're actually forced back in at higher levels and sometimes that could be a rinse and repeat and they never catch a longer term trend but with this market making new highs there's going to be some pressure on those who've been sitting on the sidelines believe it or not now this bull market will end when that last person throws in the towel, collectively, I should say, or metaphorically. But as more people finally get sucked into the market, that's when you end up with like a blow off type, type of move. People like, I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to hop in. And that's how bubbles happen in any market. Go back several thousand years ago and study the rice markets of Japan Tulip mania, I think it was in the 1600s. There's a pretty big blow off move right before 29. In more recent times, obviously, NASDAQ 1999, before it lost 70 something percent of its value. I saw today, and somebody had an article out that we could be entering a blow off. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, a thousand percent. Because. When the market's at new highs like this, people get forced in. Buying can actually beget more buying. Now, I wouldn't do this as a strategy in and of itself, but I've seen people do it and do well. And I ran a uh, – this was not an actual trading portfolio, but I actually ran a hypothetical portfolio just to see what happened, where all I did, with a few caveats, but all I did was buy new highs – and it did have a few nuances, like every now and then it get whacked pretty hard. But but if you could withstand the volatility, 
longer term, it did incredibly well. And that's exactly what I tell kids to do when they ask me for help in their stock picking contest is to just simply buy new highs. Margin call. <laughs> All right, Russell 2000, bam, winning. Speaking of new highs, but getting more new highs, look at that. All-time highs if we close here, okay? Decent day there, too. As I often preach, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. Usually, traders don't agree for long, but you can see we've been stuck in this base for over a year, and that becomes a value zone. Remember, everything I do has a psychological backing to it, okay? So the 135, 140-something level, 140-ish level, is a value zone in the Russell 2000, and that's established for over a year. So when that market finally breaks out or breaks down, then it's that buying or selling could be get more selling because you're moving away from that value zone. And anyone who didn't bother buying because it's stuck in a range, like I mentioned with the S&P 500, has to put up or shut up. Now, I like to look at the major mid groups whenever the market is at new highs just to see what the breadth is doing. I actually look at all 239 of these every day. But if you just kind of flip through these real quick, you can see most sectors are at or near new highs. Transports. Dow theorists like to make sure transports follow along. Look at the energies banging out new highs, not all time highs, but new highs nonetheless. And that's why I have so many energies on my watch list today. And I'm going to have to, for instance, right now, Donald is asking about an energy stock. Nope, we can't talk about that one because that one's on my list too. <laughs> but good job. And there's a few exceptions in here, but most area banks, let's take a look at financials in general, XLF. You can see brand new highs. Automotive, drugs, just off of new highs. Utility is not so hot, but not horrible. But that's to be expected as interest rates begin to creep up. Tobacco, not so good, but insurance, brand new highs. Defense, new highs. Software, not too far from new highs. So again, most sectors looking pretty darn good in here. If you don't have time to go through all 239 plus some ETFs every day. At least look at these major mid groups to see what's happening. Chemicals right around new highs. So overall, things are looking pretty good, at least for now. All right, let's take a look at some of your stock picks. If they're energy related, I probably already have it on my list. Yes, Ken, you guessed correctly. Good job there. No flies on you guys. You're in that one too. Yep. Good job, Ken. WGO. Winnebago. Well, as a trend guy, I'm not going to argue with this. I'm just going to – the only thing I throw out is, is there something at lower levels that you could go after, maybe not quite as extended – but it certainly looks pretty darn good, okay? It's broken out to new highs, and it's pulled back a little bit. And guess what? Your good eye on this because you've caught the persistency. I would like to have seen a little bit more solid breakout to new highs, but it looks okay, and a little bit more knockout. But it's not bad. You could certainly do a lot worse. If you said, Dave, I traded Winnie Bago off of this pattern, I certainly couldn't argue with you too much on that. So, Carson, good job. PGH. That sounds like an energy stock. Yeah, it's obviously low priced in here. Um, one reason that I think I had this on my list, but I took it off, was because it does have a lot of overhead supply. It's not horrible. And I guess it's you'd make a little bit of money if it hit that overhead supply, but that's why I took it off my list. But it's not bad. I think if you... If you dug a little further, I think you could find something just a slightly better with a little less overhead resistance. Steve wants to talk about THO. Yeah, THO looks like it's another one of those RV type of stocks, right? What do they, what do they make? Anybody know? It's not bad. I'd like to see this knockout move be a little greater. 
you've got persistency, you've got acceleration, you got a breakout, but this knockout move I think needs to be a little bit deeper on this, okay? But it's certainly not bad. It's I mean, you know, you guys have gotten so much better. It's like I guess I've I've, I've beat so many people up. One poor guy doesn't come back anymore because. You never like any stock I pick. It's like, well, start picking better stocks. <laughs> yeah, it's like, can you draw a big blue arrow in the direction of the trend? No? Well, then don't mention it. So he, I ran him off. So I'm sorry about that. But I want you to learn. And I want you to get better. I don't have all the answers. And that's why I'm searching and researching. DCPH, Dave Light. Yeah, this is an IPO. Um, the Dave Light pattern would be you put in the five-day moving average, and it's on my website in a couple of places. Will it take a five-day moving average? Or too too late? No, we don't have enough days. Right? It, it it bleh, it won't take one till day six. But it is another pattern that um, I recognize. But yeah, good uh, good eye on that one, two, three, four, five. Why won't it take a moving average? It won't do it. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe at the end of today it'll work. I don't know why it won't show it. But yeah, you put in a put in a five-day moving average. One, two, three, four, five. Today's day six. I don't know where it is. Well, that's troubling. But yeah, if it closes up here at all-time highs, that would actually be a buy. Steve wants to know about SID. That sounds like a metal stock. Yeah, that's a um, – I was watching this one a while back. That's going to be like a, a foreign, I want to say Brazil. Uh, it's kind of got a lot of overhead supply to deal with longer term. And you could see that if you were playing that deep pullback, then it's already rallied all the way back to its prior highs. So for me to get excited about it, it would have to break out to new highs and not look back for a while and then have a pullback. Are you already long? Baba. Well, the first thing jumps out at me at Baba is it's gone pretty much nowhere for, is it two months, month and a half? So that's the first thing that would scare me about that. In a case like this, I throw some moving averages in. Well, you can see the 10 days kind of downish, and the other ones are still up. So nothing to gleam there. But you certainly can see that it hasn't made any forward progress in a while. So based on that action, I think I would pass. I, I know I would pass, okay? So in order to trade it, it would have to break out the new highs and then it pull back somewhere along the way. Notice I've got a join in here, nice little TK. See, this is kind of TKO move you want to see in a trend, something that sticks out like a sore thumb. Let me just show you this real quick. So I'd much rather see a pattern like this, okay, at a stock in a good-looking trend as opposed to a stock go on and begin to flatten out. Now, if you're long... By all means, stay long and be in longer-term trend-following mode because you're just off of all-time highs. But I would pass on that one. RGLD for claws. RGLD. I haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? Welcome back. My problem here is it's pulled all the way back to its prior peak and all the way back to its little breakout point. It's a gold stock. So I think you could probably find something a little cleaner in gold. IAG recently set up. Hasn't really worked out just yet. But notice IAG these last few trading days notwithstanding. But notice that IAG, look what it did here. Let me sort of throw, throw out something that looked a little bit better. Notice that it made a nice persistent move higher and pulled back. And that cleared all that trading. Whereas if you take a look at at this one, it it cleared the prior peak, it cleared the, the nearby peak, but then it came all the way back in. So I would leave that alone in gold if you're going up to something in gold. Let's take a look at gold to commodity. You can see gold to commodity was taken off a while back, but now it's come all the way back in to its breakout. So maybe that's why these gold stocks are, are floundering a little bit. 
So unless you think you have the mother of all setups, I think I would pass on anything in gold. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Doing okay. And you? I'm doing great. Welcome back. You, where'd you go? <laughs> I guess that's the next question. Yeah, this looks uh, really interesting in here. It is a little extended longer term, but uh, I hear you. And it's beginning to pull back. A little bit deeper pullback maybe on this one. At this juncture, I sure would like to find something a little bit earlier in the trend. But as a trend guy, I can't argue with this. Who brought this up? Carson. Yeah, you, you know what you're doing. Appreciate that. Um, I recognize that, I should say. A little bit deeper pullback, and then I give it a, a, a maybe. But I'd also be on the lookout for something maybe at a little bit lower levels. WTI, thanks for another nice webinar, Steve. Yeah, WTI has been on my list for a while, but I'll go ahead and show it. Um, I like it a lot. It was actually an official setup a few days ago in the service. And I swapped it out for one of those stocks we were just talking about, I think. Or one of the stocks that was mentioned earlier, I should say. Um, it, it is a little wide and loose and crazy longer term, but if you back the chart way out and squint your eyes, it has a bit of that Phoenix characteristic. By Phoenix, I mean can rise from the ashes. Now, there's not this isn't a direct strategy, I should say, but just a general approach with some of these uh, transitional patterns, such as the first thrust into bow tie. When you get a first thrust off of major lows, especially after that low is a huge, big picture bottom that took a couple of years to develop. Again, it's kind of the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. Sometimes they can go back to their old highs. So in a case like this, if this thing went back to its old highs or even got halfway there, you'd be making a lot of money. I feel like <laughs> was the last week I was imitating those silver commercials. If silver gold is just halfway back to its old highs, I don't know what my aunt had, you know, she'd be my uncle. You know, <laughs> a lot of ifs in that sentence. <laughs> You know, my father-in-law brought up an interesting point of uh, a while back when gold was bottoming out, looking pretty good. He asked me about it and I said, well, yeah, I think now's a good time to buy gold. And he, he kept saying, well, why would they be selling it? Because all these radio commercials, you know, well, why would they be selling it? So if silver is going to go back to its old highs or at least half of its whole time highs, right, why would they be selling it? You know, why just not keep it for themselves? But, yeah, nice base this thing is launched off of. It's a little squirrely because it's going straight up, a little dangerous, I should say. But looking pretty damn good. Nice base, nice persistent move higher, and then a nice TKO, kind of a two-day TKO in here. Let's see if I can make it look right. There you go. But, yeah, that's a good-looking stock, very good-looking stock. And I don't know. Maybe I'll regret taking it off my official uh, – setup list but i think there's some other ones that have just as much potential at least how many positions sectors are you long short in the mo at the moment uh i have let's take a look at the oopsies i'm supposed to show that <laughs> uh the model portfolio we have one two three nope that one stopped out we have three open positions and then I have some personal positions in uh, – I have a couple of biotechs that I'm long outside of this. So maybe about five stocks total. And in the model portfolio, there's three stocks in the model portfolio that are still open, Chem, CNDT, and CRC. And their CRC is an energy. We're looking at one more energy today. And then uh, Kim is electronics, C and DT. I have no idea what they do. I'll have to double check that. Um, and then we've got a couple of uh, IPOs we're looking at as possible add-on trades. And I'm long two IPOs right now. So five stocks total would be the answer to that. Um, when it comes to sectors, usually in a portfolio – I have a maximum of two stocks per sector is my uh, unwritten rule. And what happens is in an ideal world, let's say you have two positions on in a particular sector. Well, let's say one triggers on day one and then the next one triggers down the road. Well, 
each position is one half. So you take one position when you put it on, you divide it into two halves. And the first one, as I showed earlier, is going to be your profit taking position. And your second one's going to be your trend following position. So let's say you put on another position and you've got another two halves on. Okay. So now what's one plus one? That's two. So if, and I know it's 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 an unknown, but if this one goes up to the initial profit target, you take it off, and now you have one and a half positions on, okay? And let's say this one goes up, you're really doing good, and you take it off. Now you have one full position on, okay? Because this is the half position, this is the half position, okay, even though it's two stocks. So now you have room for one more stock in that sector. So you could end up with multiple stocks in one sector, but you only end up with one full position. Or another way of looking at it is 2% uh, total risk in that. Now, I know it gets a little tricky when you're in longer term trend following mode because when they begin to draw down, not if, when they begin to draw down towards a stop, you will get stopped out and give up some of those gains in your sector exposure could be a little bit bigger than 2%, but going into the trade is 2%. And open profits, as Dennis pointed out in the way of the turtle, or as was pointed out by Faith about Dennis, open profits are treated differently than, than open losses that exceed your risk-loss parameters. In other words, if you're not honoring your stop, that's a problem. But if you're up 200% in a trade and you stop out at 175%, that's okay. That's not a problem. That's life. That's markets. It happens. Okay. With how many positions are you comfortable? Uh, it's never enough when the market's going up, and then it's always too many when the market goes against you. Uh, let me answer that in terms of margin. Okay. I try to stay off of margin, but if I if I run out of money in my trading account or trading accounts, whatever how you want to look at it and I see a position that I really like, I will take it on margin knowing that the odds are that some of those stocks in my portfolio are likely to hit the initial profit target and I'll be taking that risk off. So it's kind of like a risk on, risk off situation. When markets get really choppy, I'm okay with zero stocks in the portfolio. I was in a webinar the other day and right before the webinar, some lady was showing her system and some people were like, well, how many trades does it make? How many trades does it make? They were all anxious about the number of trades. They were asking the wrong question. You know, the question should be, can you make money with it? Okay, not how many trades it makes. The number of trades is irrelevant. The number of trades, not correct, but the number of trades where you make money. And, and not being correct and making money or being right and making money are two different things. Carsten is asking, uh, is, is in your Morningstar data system a sector more general or an industry compared to GICS or ICB? GICS, is that an actual stock? Is that an ETF? Uh, there are subsectors within them. Within them. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what GICS or ICB is, but if you go to the Morningstar groups, you could see if you sort them by symbol, and if you go to like um, semiconductors is a good example. Because in semiconductors, you have like the board makers, the PCBs, semiconductors in general, something like um, chem. See, this is this is the broad sector, electronics. But now you've got the broad lines, like this would be like Micron and big companies like that make a little bit of everything. You got the chip makers, which I guess might be Micron. What's in the broad one? What's in this one? Micron here. Okay, AMD, for instance, a chip maker. I guess Intel would be a chip maker. Are they in here? Yeah, Intel, AMD, your chip makers are in here. So you have the different things and like in energies you would have like the the drillers and then you would have the service providers 
global industry classification. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. But if it works for you, you don't. The morning, I use the Morningstar groups because I have them, and they're easy to use, and they're automatically updated. It's not like I'm out there. Oh, I got to go update my sectors. Oh, I got to go get this. Oh, I got to get that. It seems like an old school way of doing things. That's why I fell in love with TC, and I, I, I avoided it for years, thinking it was too cheap and too simple. And I am an affiliate, by the way. If you click on that little button on my website at the top, due to trading or methodology, you can get to my affiliate link. And I, I would strongly urge, even even if you have other other quote systems, it's good for for this type of research. And it's quick and dirty. And I like the fact that I can look at a lot of charts with it. I've actually, I'm affiliate for another uh, chart manufacturer, chart provider. And I'm like, guys, please give me a a way to hit my space bar and look at a lot of charts. You know, I'm begging them to, to give me something more simple and easy. It's quick and dirty, as the programmers say. But yeah, if you have if you have a, a list of sectors you're using, then by all means, uh, use what you have. And, you know, ETFs could be quite useful. And, and in, for instance, you'll notice I'll pull up the XLF a lot, and that's because the financials within the Morningstar groups or a lot of uh, asset management companies. And that's not, to me, that's not true financials because they're probably just following along with S&P 500 or whatever, and that's giving you a false read. So I like the XLF or something like that. So maybe put together a list of ETFs that you want to use to track sectors. That's a great idea. Or, you know, do what I do. Look at 2,000 stocks every day, and that'll let you know whether stocks are going up or down. Howard wants to talk, Howard wants to talk about loan. Yeah, it's not set up, though. It's uh, put it on your momentum list. It's, it's uh, pretty thin, a little on the thin side, a lot on the thin side, I should say. Still a relatively new issue. Sometimes new issues, they, they do the initial fly and then they die. And you can see in this particular case, you would not have gotten long this stock with those pioneer patterns. So you stayed out of a lot of trouble. And then sometimes they come down here and bottom out and look really good and can set up and then become more like a Phoenix stock, go back to their old high. So yeah, absolutely. But on a setup, wait for it to pull back a little bit. Oh, it's a bow tie? Yeah, I bet it is. I can eyeball, but oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so you need like a one bar pullback in here to complete the pattern. Put it on your watch list. But remember, it's going to be really, really thin and volatile, okay? So just know the devil going in. Give it a lot of rum, which means you'll trade less shares. GDI, which is Gardner, Denver, I think. <clears throat> Yeah, that looks fantastic. Uh, you've got a, an IPO, a relatively new issue. It really didn't do a whole lot, as you can see, when it first came out. This is not that big of a move for an IPO, but now you've got this very. Th this is a high five. This is a high five worthy moment. Uh, it needs a little bit deeper pullback, though. I wish it was maybe down to about 26 and a half. But this is if this isn't on my watch list now, it definitely needs to be. Oh. It's a no, it's not too bad. It's got it's got enough volume to trade, so it's decent. Needs a little bit more pullback, but yeah, that needs to be on your watch list. Obviously, it already is. <laughs> Good job. High five. ALRN. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. You could have that little uh, Dave light pattern working here. Let's take a look at this. So a new high would be would have to take out what 14. Actually, this would be a new high here. Let's just say 14 round numbers. Just way above it. Okay, yeah, you wouldn't be you wouldn't have the daylight or daylight above the moving average, but I hear you new highs. So I think I'd wait for follow through on that one. E G A N. Well, Andre, hey Andre, good to see you. Uh, kind of thin, super thin. Super thin and a lot of bad memories back here. I mean, I hear you. It's certainly trending, but I would pass based on the fact that it's super thin and has a lot of bad memories. So, um, traveling in Europe, Oktoberfest. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> One, because I'm low carb in it. <laughs> Two, I'd love to bake it. I was, um, I was in Germany a few years back, and they were telling me about Oktoberfest, and it sounded wonderful. I've been trying to find a beer 
since I've gotten back. Uh, Schaffen, Schaffenhofer, Heiss, uh, it's a Hefenweizen. Cannot find it here to save my life. And it's the most delicious beer I've ever had in my life. You're welcome, Steve. DRNA sounds like a biotech to me. Deroxic riboic nucleic acid. See, I pay attention in biology. Well, you've got a couple things working here. One, you definitely have persistency. You definitely have acceleration, but the only thing missing is the actual setup. This is on my. This is in. Uh, I had this in my watch list. Now it does have some bad memories. That's way back in 2015. Based on the magnitude of this move, based on this huge, 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 huge base that it's made, I think you've got something special here. So yeah, on a pullback, I would be all over this stock. Who gave me that one, Andre? High five, Andre. Good job. <laughs> CYRX. Yeah, CYRX is actually set up again. I told my peeps last night. Um, I don't know if you're still active on the service or not, uh, Carlston, but uh, yeah, it, it looks good as an add-on trade. It's a, it's a little too deep with today's movement, but it's okay. Uh, if you wanted to come back in on this one, I think it's it's certainly plausible. I realize it pulled back to this prior peak, which I'm not crazy about, but the magnitude of this move is such that it's okay to have this deep retracement. Uh, I'd say an entry here. And then a stop below today's low, and then broadcast that up for your initial profit target. And I think you got a, I think you got a trade, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, that looks good. Good job on that one. Using two percent position sizing can sometimes result in very large positions relative to your account value. Do you ever limit the position size when it occurs? No. And there's a presentation out there. I don't. I guess these things could be better organized, but 2% could give you a big percentage of your account value. If you're trading, I know you like to trade. Um, Steve likes to trade, if memory serves, less volatile stocks, and they, turn, they often end up being higher priced. The only problem with that is, and I wish I, could, I, wish I had the spreadsheet on the fly, but yeah, you could end up with a huge position. Uh, the example that I gave had like a one point stop or like a two point stop, whatever, in a $40 stock. Let's just say two points, $40. I don't know the calculator handy, but and then I had like an eight point stop on a more volatile stock that was only, uh, well, let's just use $40 to make the math easy. So in this more volatile stock, if you have an eight point stop, you're only ended up with a couple hundred shares or 100 shares. It's not much. But the example I gave and going and, and get the spreadsheet off of, off of uh, YouTube, you'll see that it was like 80% of the account value was in that one stock. So if you're trading lower volatility stocks and or higher price stocks, a lot of times, yes, you could end up with a lot of your account in one account uh, stock. And that's where the danger comes in. So, yeah, what you observed is not um, is true. <laughs> MRSN super thin. All right, let's take a look at that. Why do I know this stock? MRSN. Yeah, I like this one. Um, it's obviously still an IPO. It needs a little bit more knockout move. You don't want too much because it'll it'll come back to this 18 level. But it looks interesting. Let's let's take a look at the Dave Light. If you put a five day moving average in here. Would it have gotten you along somewhere? Well, buy it B would have gotten you along here. But I wouldn't have taken this trade, or I didn't take this trade, actually, because the range wasn't that great back here. But, yeah, absolutely. If it a uh, tiny bit more of a pullback, I think it might be plausible. But, yes, you answered your own question. You got in your 18? Cool. Yeah, that's kind of a brand new, a breakout type of thing. Um, I'm not a huge fan of breakouts, but in IPOs, I will trade breakouts, believe it or not. I know. Never say never, huh? RGLD, did we cover that one? Yeah, we covered that one. Uh, S-R-A-X. Uh, looks like it's kind of thin. HV is crazy. That's the first thing jumps out at me, 141. Um, a lot of bad memories, but, yeah, if I got in a stock at 2 and it went to 6, I wouldn't complain. It's a little bit on the fence. If you multiply the price time volume, 
it's pretty thin, small cap stock. It also shot up, what, 300%, well, a little bit more than that, uh, a little bit less than that, I should say, but peaked the trough two or 300% over a few days. I call it a bottle rocket. A lot of times it goes straight up and it goes straight back down. Watch the, um, watch the video on the stock selection course page. Just go to my store, go to stock selection course, and then watch the video. And I talk about the bottle rocket type of patterns. IPO. Yeah, I remember I was doing my IPO course and I watched this thing implode. This is a, a, an ETF on IPOs. I'm like, I need to call these people up, tell them I trade IPOs. I'm printing money and they're actually losing their butt. But you can see they're doing pretty good now. Jay says, uh, my charts, don't have my charts up, but I'd be a breakout building on KL if remember rig. I'm not sure what you're saying, Jay. You're trading IPO breakouts? How does my service work? I do a video every day. If you look at my homepage, you can get an example of that. Um, I think I'm going to probably phase out the delayed service. It's just um, it's too hard to keep up with because there's a lot of parameters going into whether or not to show them. But if you go to my homepage on my website, uh, Susie, you'll see what uh, if it comes up. I'm waiting for it to come up while we're waiting on that. Oh, here we go. All right, VKTX. Okay, uh, kind of thin based on the volume, but I hear you. A little dangerous, a little squirrely, but yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. I mean, you know, sometimes these companies come public and die. You know, I can call this my Phoenix IPO thing. This is a Phoenix IPO thing. They die. They base, they get their act together, then they take off again. Yeah, put that put that on your watch list, but it's not actually set up just yet. So if you go to my homepage, and if you look right here, I went I went ahead and put six posts on here. But this one right here, uh, 927 trading setups for my service. So if you click here, it'll always, this is where the delayed service is probably going to end up. And then you just click here, and this is going to be the actual video that I put out on that particular day. That is pretty much the service. There is some comments that I put below, but usually there's not a whole lot of comments because it's much easier for me to just, you know, picture's worth a thousand words, put it in the picture. So check that out. If you like it, let me know. Love Today, to have you. Is Oops. Tuesday. I got room for one more person, so we'll, we'll take you on. PDP Momo. PDP Momo, PDP. This is got a thin ETF, but yeah, absolutely, it's breaking out on pullbacks. Momo, CATB, or as I call it, Cat B. Well, it's got a lot of bad memories back here. So there were some other um, ETFs that looked better. Calabasas. Anybody watch Ray Donovan? Calabasas. <laughs> I, I hear you. It's accelerating higher, uh, maybe on a knockout, but it's got such bad memories. I would pass. Anybody who bought it back here might be looking to ditch. Now, is there a gap in the charts? Is that an old ticker back here? Let's see. No, nope. that looks like that looks legitimate. Yeah, I think there's other biotechs. I mean, we mentioned a few today that are coming off of lows that might be worthwhile. MRS, MRNS, MRNS, MRNS. Uh, yeah. HV is kind of crazy. It's it's double the it's it's just too crazy. I mean, I hear you. Maybe on a pullback, but it's it's a little crazy. 
I think there's other biotechs out there. Do you have a low limit referring to volume on IPOs? Also 250. No, it's a little bit. The, I went through a long-winded answer in the IPO course on that. I don't know if you have the course or not, but if you do, uh, go in and watch it. You have to take it on a day by day, but you actually have to look at the individual days. And then every now and then, like I'm stuck in one now that that really the volume is now too low. And so it happens. It's, it's a gamble. Uh, 250,000 on average, maybe 200,000 on uh, stocks in general, more established issues. But with IPOs, I, I look at them on a case by case basis, day by day basis. And I see how much volume is there. Um, let me just give you an example of one. I'm long. Let's see what the volume was. Vi see, the volume is pretty low now. Let's see what the volume was. I like to look at, like, the opening day, and you can see it was in the millions. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, here it was uh, 200,000. No, it was in the millions, 2 million. So you had quite a few. Um, you had pretty serious volume in this, like in the millions going in, and now it's, it's dried up a little bit. But – you got to look at each individual day. You can't take an average volume because there's no volume in the average. But yeah, if you got 250,000 on, on an IPO, absolutely. That, that's plenty. Yeah, Andre, this looks okay. Uh, I love the big long base. It is a little, it's a crazy Andre stock. I know stocks you like to trade. I get to know you guys. I know you like these volatile low price issues, which I can't really blame you. I think it looks all right. Um, it needs a knockout move, though, maybe down to like 425 or something. But, yeah, it's going to be very volatile and also pretty darn thin. But you're you're a man. I've met you in person. You can probably whip my butt. <laughs> so you you can handle those, uh, those uh, more volatile issues. Uh, Micron, it's breaking out to all time. Micron's really thick. That's my only problem with it. Uh, it can move, though, so maybe on a pullback. Jillian? No, I'd pass. Too flat. I mean, you got all these crazy biotechs going straight up, and then you got this one's kind of dying out. If you're long, stay long, obviously. All right, we got time for just a couple of more. V-Cell. That's going to be another crazy Andre stock. Yeah, it looks okay. I'm not nuts about this gap here. But it looks okay. Um, a little wide and loose and crazy longer term, but so is like that uh, CYRX. Uh, it's it's okay. I don't know. I just can't wrap my head around this gap here, but that's not bad. We haven't heard about the best stock in the world. What's that, Kim? I forget which one that is. Is it one year long? It's one I'm long? AKCA, is that the best stock in the world? <laughs> It's not set up right now, though. Getting hit a little bit today. Uh, but, yeah, it looks pretty good. Absolutely. I want to pull back, though. Let it uh, pull back to maybe like, eh, let's say, 25. TGB. We've got time for two more, a couple more. Yeah, TGB begging out new highs in here. It's going to be a metals stock. Um but it's plowing right into this overhead supply. I know it's a long time ago, but I think I would pass just based on the magnitude. There's so much overhead supply it's going into. I pass on that. With these commodity stocks in general, I like to find them coming off of lower levels. Well, look, we're out of time. I, as usual, appreciate you guys and girls taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email at daviddave. Landry.com. If it's an answer that requires a lot of thought, I'll turn it, turn it into fodder for next week's show. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. You're welcome, Andre, Jill, Don, Howard, Peter. You're welcome. Thank you so much.